Welcome to Marvel Vision, a podcast about Marvel, the MCU, and right now, a bunch of news updates. I'm Alex. I'm Justin, and, and this is my news diet that I like to consume. Yeah, this is the only newspaper that I read. This is a newspaper, right, that we're doing right now? Yeah. Oh, I take everything we say and I write it down meticulously, and then I oh. go on the street corner and say, this it, this just in. Extra, extra, read all about it, Marvel News. Well, listen, for all of you out there, if you got any tips or stories you want us to cover, you can always email us at comicbookclublive at gmail.com or hit us up on one of the socials at Marvel Vision Pod on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. But we've got a bunch of fun stories to talk about today. We were pretty heavy the last episode. This will be a lighter one. So there you go. Oh, nice. We got some trailers. We got to catch up on some other stories. But let's start off with a fun one. A Marvel DC crossover could happen but should it happen that's my question to you <laughs> wow, wow. adventurers uh james gunn is on a tour for guardians of the galaxy 3 of course as he's taken over dc studios he's getting a lot of questions about that at the crossover there this specifically came from an interview with empire where he was asked straight up will there ever be a marvel dc crossover and here's what he Great had question. to say about it i'm certain that's more likely now that i'm in charge at dc who knows that's many years away, though. I think we have to establish what we're doing at DC first. I would be lying to say that we haven't discussed it, but all discussions have been very, very light and fun. So good answer, I think, first of all, yeah. from James Gunn. Great answer. Great question. Yeah. Great answer. But what do you think about this? Could this happen, actually, and should this happen? Well, I'm trying to think. It's This is really uncharted territory in the movie space because we just now, comic book movies are what they are. Like, it's not like we've ever in the past had like James Bond crossing over with uh, Toy Story or something. Mm -hmm. Like, you can have like uh, a little toy appear in it. But like, in a way, we've had a couple crossover elements in that in like Eternals, they talk about Batman. So like, mm -hmm. there's definitely the possibility is right there. Yeah, they could definitely, like, they could make references. There was a thing in Shazam 2 where they say Captain Marvel, and apparently they had a whole discussion on set about, can we say that? Are we allowed to say that? And yeah. eventually, it, it was exactly what you said. They were like, yeah, in Eternals, they said Batman and Superman, so it's fine. We can say whatever. It's all good. Um, I don't know if legally that's the answer to that question, but... <laughs> In terms of bringing the characters together, I think the only real example is Roger Rabbit, right? Where you had mm. a bunch of Warner Brothers characters showing up in a Disney movie. That is decades ago at this point. The movie business is very different. Warner Brothers is very different. Disney is very different. I'm of two minds about this. I think in mm -hmm. one sense, there is an argument. Have you been crying? Me. You feel it. This feels very I'm serious sobbing. for you. <laughs> I'm sobbing. I've been sobbing for hours since James Gunn said this. No, I, I, I'm of two minds. I think there's uh, the film critic perspective, which I don't think is totally wrong, is if you did this, this is where we reach creative bankruptcy <laughs> with the superhero movies. That's the most extreme way of saying it. But they would have to probably be very desperate to do this, right? As companies, just from a financial perspective. I mean, desperate, it could be. Desperation could definitely lead to something like this. Or, like, you get someone with the right amount of swing. James mm -hmm. Gunn has that juice. Like, if Guardians 3 crushes like we expect it to, he's head of, head of DC. Like, he can swing that, I think, from a deal-making perspective. And then it comes down to, like, the contractual lawyer side of it. And then, then it's just, after that, it's just another movie. It's like, let's make a sick Avengers movie. What so, I but could, with DC Avengers Justice League. Well, what I could see happening rather than the Amalgam universe, which for anybody who doesn't know, this was a comic book crossover between DC Marvel back in the day where they jabbed the characters together. So you got like Dark Claw, who was a Batman, who was a Wolverine, and all of these other characters that were mix-ups of the Marvel and DC characters. I don't think we can get something like that. But if you go with James Gunn's plan for DC, where he's got this 10-year plan for the stories if you end with some sort of crisis on infinite earths type story i think the best case most likely scenario is they're zipping through universes and he zips by you know superman flies by the guardians and they're like whoa who's that guy you know or yeah. something like that versus yeah. a full-on marvel versus dc movie 
let me because I agree with you. I don't think it uh, going into like a major like all the Avengers and all the Justice League fight in a movie. Uh, but I could see like a little side movie that's like Wolverine, say X-Men be- comes out and becomes very popular. Say like Batman versus Wolverine, to use mm-hmm. your example before, as like a little like one-off special. I like the way that in comics they do that like series now where it'll be like Batman and Hellboy. And that'll be its own thing. And they don't really ever fully mix the peanut butter and chocolate. Mm-hmm. It's just like a little separate thing. And then you come back to your separate corners. I like how you're referring to it as this little one-off special when Batman versus Wolverine would be the biggest movie of all time. But that's what I'm saying. That's where, like, you talk about desperation being the only mm-hmm. driver. But, like, th- that movie would be – everyone would lose it. Like, that's mixing the biggest characters from both universes. So, mm-hmm. like, there's not even a fight anymore about which is best because they're together. Uh but let me also say, like, I, James Gunn is right in that he's like, crossover with Marvel? We don't even have our th- shit in order over here yet. Let's give me a second. Now. My room's not clean. I can't have guests over yet. Yeah. But I could definitely imagine him and Kevin Feige, who Kevin Feige seems very supportive of what James Gunn is doing over at DC for obvious reasons. And I, I don't think that's just lip service. You know, clearly they respect each other creatively. And James Gunn's whole thing is working with people creatively. So... Yeah, like we're saying, I think it's something they'll joke about and joke about and joke about for 10 years until maybe something happens. You know, maybe Warner Brothers buys Disney or vice versa, and then suddenly we've got Avengers versus Justice League. That's the most likely possibility. Now that you say that is like corporate uh, collection and like then all of a sudden it doesn't matter. But I mean, I don't know. I'm even more nervous about like the X-Men crossing over with the Avengers. Like that to me is why. What what makes you nervous about that? Because that to me is that's different different mindsets. I don't know how it, even in comics they've never done a great job of being like we hate these X Men, but we love those Avengers. Like as if the <laughs> the people of the world are somehow getting a DNA test to be like, oh, those X Men don't trust them because they got their powers from their genes. Avengers love them. The Hulk smash my whole family. Still love them. X Men <laughs> hate hate them. <laughs> so, like, there's a philosophical difference at the core of those two different uh, universes within Marvel. And uh, mixing them is a little – It's there's something in my – it's get a little catch in my brain. Mm-hmm. Well, it's definitely going to happen. I mean, there's tons of rumors about this, and I think this is just fans thinking, although I imagine it's going to happen anyway. But – that all of the old X-Men characters of the Fox movies are going to show up in Secret Wars, something like that. I think that yeah. makes sense. You know, now we're getting it like very far afield to this. But I think that makes a lot of sense, just given that Kevin Feige started his career working on X-Men movies. So yeah. if he is not bringing his career to close, but this chapter to a close with Secret Wars and then rebooting the universe or whatever happens past that, he's going to want to bring back Patrick Stewart, Ian McKellen, Adam Paquin? I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. The fans cry out in unison for Anna Paquin to return. Yes. Uh, yeah. No, it's it's definitely feels like – that's why I also think we're going to get a Miles Morales live action out of this mm-hmm. as well. So, like, they're definitely doing what Secret Wars and all of the nature crossovers have done uh, in DC as well with Crisis. Like, okay, let's fix some things that we don't like anymore. And they're going to do that on the movie scale. But last thing that I'll say, and then we'll move on to talk more about Miles Morales, is that I think at this point, given that Warner Brothers is on, what is it called, back heels or whatever the expression is, they're more likely to be like, hey, let's throw the Avengers in here than Marvel, who, as we've talked about, has taken a lot of knocks recently. But I don't think they're they're going to be like, sure, let's cut to the new Superman at the end of Secret Wars or something like that. They don't need to. But... This dynamic and this power dynamic is rapidly changing and will be entirely different in five years by the time those movies come out. So I don't know. We'll we'll revisit this conversation a lot, I think. Definitely. But I I don't think the threat to each of them isn't the other, I think. Mm -hmm. I think the larger threat is, oh, we as a culture are sick of these movies. Mm -hmm. The same way that like Westerns were the biggest thing for like 15 years and then it went away and like slow it faded and it went to TV a little bit, just like superheroes have done. And then eventually it was like, well, we don't really make these anymore. And that's going to happen with superhero movies. So I feel like they're going to have a meetup and be like, we're not enemies here. The enemy is time or <laughs> lack of interest. We've already done told these stories so many times. We're losing focus. Let's 
throw this on the table and see if we can gin it back up for a little bit. And that's how you end up with a Young Guns or Tombstone, a.k.a. the DC versus Marvel of the Western universe. That's right. Young Guns is definitely held up as the um, Western <laughs> Secret Wars, <laughs> the term I hear and say a lot. Oh, my gosh. Constantly. You never stop saying that. Let's talk. Uh, let's when am a... I not talking about Young Guns also? Jeez. Young great. Guns? You never talk about Young Guns too. That's the confusing part, yeah. and that's the better one. <laughs> I've written it up. Let's do some trailer catch up. These are two trailers that came out right after our previous podcast. So all of you out there have probably watched them a million times already. But as mentioned before with Miles Morales, we got the full Across the Spider-Verse trailer. Everybody has noticed this. Everybody has pointed this out. But we do get a scene in there of Spider-Man 2099 calling out, don't even get me started on what that nerd did with Doctor, that Doctor Strange did with that nerd from... Earth 199999. There's been a lot of discussion about that because in Multiverse of Madness, they call it Earth 616, the Marvel MCU, which it's not. That's the comic book universe. The official designation of the MCU is Earth 19999. I'm definitely getting the nines wrong there, but I don't care. This uh, is what they all think we're talking about. And look, we are. <laughs> we have a Marvel podcast, man. Of course we're doing that. Uh, but overall, what do you think about this trailer? What were your big takeaways other than this Easter egg that ties it into the MCU? I mean, we, we've talked about it a little bit um, on other podcasts, but like, it's great. The, the potential here to uh, raise the bar on the first movie and we have a third movie too. So it, it's a little bit weird. There's a little bit of danger there for this to be very in What's the middle. What's up, danger? Yeah, exactly. What? Uh, the, the, song, uh, the song from the no, movie. No, What's no, up, no, Danger? Okay. Beautiful. What up, Danger? I actually uh, sang the backing track for that. Oh, man. The side job as a backing male vocalist are unbelievable. <laughs> Great to hear the winds. The uh, sort of elevating this and also combining it and reaching out into the larger world of Spider-Man is, is very exciting. But again, Danger higher. Definitely danger higher, and it's definitely something on like the third or fourth time through watching the trailer I was thinking about in terms of they actually haven't told us a lot of the plot of this movie. Like they've hinted at it. We see the spot. We see that Miles clearly has some break with these multiversal Spider-Man. So Spider-Man 2099, who is leading them, is chasing Love. after him in some way. All of this stuff is great, but reportedly this is a two hour plus movie. So They've shown us the tiniest little scotch of it, and I don't think we really have a sense of what the scale is of what's actually happening here at the current time. And uh, agreed, and especially because they did the multiverse, they did the Spider-Verse in the first one, right? Yeah. It sort of to a great effect. Now we're doing multiverse in the MCU. If, the, if this is just like, hey, it's the multiverse again, like I feel like that's not, that's not a win. Like I think it needs to somehow get us into a new thing. A new well, I think I think here's and again, we've only seen two minutes, a little more than maybe three minutes over the course of two trailers of this two hour plus movie. But the thing that really worked for me about the trailer is keeping focused on Miles and what makes Miles yeah. different and what makes him special. Looking at all of these spider bands. You know, we got Spider Gwen. We've got probably a couple of different characters. There's a glimpse of Ben Riley at one point in there. But even Ben Riley is a variant of Peter Parker. And Miguel is different. I guess the question is with all these Peter Parkers and all these variants who are all different, but maybe somewhat the same, spending the movie emotionally figuring out what makes Miles special, I think, is a really good, smart thing to hang it on. It certainly got me choked up several times while I was watching the trailer, just like when he looks up at Miguel and says, now nah, I'm going to do my own thing. That got me. Like, And yeah. to have an emotional beat like that in a trailer is really impressive. Um, I, I think they're going to nail it over the course of the movie. Like, like you said, my big question right now is this was originally one movie. They split it into two movies. Does it feel like two movies or does it feel like part one and part two? And mm -hmm. we won't know until we see it. Yeah. The other thing with multiverse is there's a there's a lot of danger that I think in comics uh, ends up happening where it's like, it's crazy. All these other characters look like the one you like. We never get to know them. We don't know how what their lives are like and what the emotional resonance is. And it's always about the hero being like, look, all these other me's. And then we move on. And I think 
in the first movie, we found the emotion, the Peter Parker emotional core and really got to explore that along with Miles and, and all of his journey from being a kid to becoming a Spider-Man of the multiverse. And this, I think, I love Spider-Man 2099 from the comics. Uh, Miguel O'Hara is a great character in the comics. If they can really hit that character, then already we have a new character that is super interesting that we can follow on an emotional journey alongside Miles. It seems like, and, and then we can move on to the next trailer here, but it seems like to me that they're using a lot of these spider bands as sight gags, which I am 100% fine with. Like just all of the pointing, the therapist scene at the end, the quick glimpse yeah. of spider horse, all of these things. They're just throwing in all these fun details. And like we're bouncing around here, if they can keep it focused on Miles as the primary, and then you got Miguel, you got whatever's going on with Gwen. We get this reintroduction of Peter B. Parker with May Day as a baby. Great. Love right. May Day Parker. Very fun. Um, so all of that, and I'm sure they'll bring back some of the other characters from the first movie as well. That's great. The other question in my mind, and I'll leave us with this, is who is the villain of the movie? Is it the spot? Does the spot amp up his powers exponentially and become the big villain? Or is there something else there? And right. my suspicion, which we've talked about quite a bit before, is they're probably going to go for the Moreland Inheritor's storyline from the comics this is basically energy vampires that feed off of spider energy and that's something that potentially could head to a place that's a real threat to all these spider bands real threat to the spider society that miguel o'hara is building up and eventually potentially and this sounds horrible but like whittle it down to just miles against them by the end of yeah. the second movie potentially that makes a lot of sense, especially if you're sort of infinitely expanding the characters to have something that's coming through and limiting them at the yeah. same time. Let's move on to the other big trailer that dropped this past week, which is Secret Invasion. So we got our first really good look at this scroll-focused spy series. We got to see Sam Jackson returning to Earth, mixing it up with Talos. We got a look at Amelia Clark's character, as well as the other villains. Maria Hill is there. Martin Freeman is back as... Martin Freeman, I guess. Yeah, uh, playing and, himself. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. What did you think about this? What were your big takeaways from watching this trailer? This is like the Avengers for all the characters that are like, oh, you think you know what's going on? Well, follow me. <laughs> so it, what a great to have all of the um, in the know spy folk coming together uh, is great. I, I, I thought this trailer was great. The, I don't know if it's going to, this is maybe uh, a little bit inflated, but I loved Andor so much and felt like a mature, like the Star Wars I've been wanting. This could be that for some, for the Marvel TV shows where it is like a high drama, high tensioned thriller that uses scrolls to their great potential in, in the MCU. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think I got Winter Soldier vibes off of this, which I think is unequivocally well, not unequivocally. It's <laughs> probably the best Marvel movie. I don't want to be like, here's the best Marvel movie. But I think everybody agrees that's top five at the very least. The, of and Marvel TV shows? Of, no, of uh, Marvel um, movies. Captain oh, America Winter Soldier. Soldier. I got Winter you, got Soldier. You. Not Falcon. I thought you would think Falcon, Winter Soldier. Captain no, America. that's bottom five. That's what I was going to say. I was like, what are you talking about? No, no, no. But you got, like, one of the things that the Russos talked about with Captain America, the Winter Soldier, is they said, oh, we're making this 70s paranoid thriller in Marvel. And they did it. Not exactly. But they got no. close to it in the MCU. That's ultimately what I want out of this series. I don't know... If they can go as far as Andor, just in terms of political complexity, that's awesome. I kind of doubt they're going to do that, but I do think we are going to get a fun, rollicking, interesting spy thriller that, particularly given the scrolls or shape changers, keeps, no pun intended, like twisting and changing exactly what's going on and who we think is who we think they are. Uh, yeah. One theory I wanted to throw out at you that I've been thinking about over the past week, and this is the stupidest possible theory, but... Sam Jackson has talked a lot about why he's not wearing the eye patch in the show mm -hmm. that we talked about this last week. His armor is off. He's on his, I keep using the phrase back heels, but he's on them and he's kind of on the run and like <laughs> coming for all of these scrolls. We see a shot. So Sam Jackson, eye patch off, wearing a gray beanie in the trailer. There's a later scene where we see Sam Jackson, eye patch on, red beanie. My mm. question is, are there two Sam Jacksons in here and one of them is a scroll? 
I bet there is just because that's the, that's, that's probably the, where that's you want to go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The idea that there are scrolls like, Oh, what color is this beanie? Zoop. I'll go with red. And it's like, Oh, whoops. That's the wrong color beat like that the whole time we can rewatch it again and spot the different mm -hmm. uh, the scroll it, it is interesting. But are we going to get like an M. Night Shyamalan uh, style like on rewatch on flashback? You can just see the that he was there. The scroll was there the whole time. That's interesting. Could be. I, I think it's more likely that we get in the first episode we find out that Nick Fury we've been following is a scrawl and that yes. gets everything that we thought was going on, whether that's the eye patch list one or the one with the eye patch, I guess we'll find out. But I also think that potentially ties into what we've been talking about is Nick Fury being like, no, we can't bring in any of the heroes. This is personal. It's personal because somebody is impersonating him. You know, that's yeah. why it becomes this one Agreed. to one thing. So I think it, plus we haven't mentioned this yet. Olivia Coleman in it. She is reliably great in everything. So good yeah. cast. Should be cast fun. is great. Now there's something I spotted. I wanted to run by you at a minute and four seconds in the trailer. There's a newspaper on the table and it says lay Avengers. Lay L E S. It's a newspaper headline. Are there French Avengers that we're going to see? Oh, okay. Is I thought you were saying French Lay Avengers news? like potato chip Avengers, but that's uh, different. And I know that's where your head goes a lot. At, all the time. You think we're going to get a French Avengers team where the Hulk is uh, like uh, a mustache, I'm, I'm, like he has a, a mustache, uh, beret, uh, and they're, the Hulk is sort of like uh, my secret. <laughs> I'm always smoking mm -hmm. a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I'm always slightly annoyed and sending back. And Captain my, America says, Je could do this all day. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh, that would be great. I'd love that. Black Widow is exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we'll see what happens. I, I am curious, and then we can move on to the next topic, but I am curious how many cameos potentially are gonna, they're going to do because there is – even though they've talked about Rhodey is in this, I know I called him Martin Freeman, but Everett Ross is in this, Maria Hill, et cetera, that they're keeping the Avengers out of it. There's an absolute possibility for a quick, like, Captain America shows up, Sam Jackson punches him in the face, he turns back to a scrawl. Like, if they don't do something like that at some point, I feel like it's a missed opportunity because you've got this whole wide universe and you've got shape changers in it. Uh, yes, and it seems like it's not just scrolls. We got a super scroll here mm -hmm. uh, where – they're more powerful, but you know, the super scroll, if you remember correctly from the comics, his powers are um, the fantastic force powers mm -hmm. in the original super scroll. Now, do you think they'll spend connection. like half an hour being like, what powers are those? Where do they come from? Which he seems to have very they? stretchy arms in this uh, trailer. Yeah. Ooh. And that other arm is like some sort of the thing. <laughs> yeah. All right, a couple of quick things. This is a very James Gunn heavy podcast, but I'll mention here anyway. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 tickets are now on sale. What? Are you buying them? I don't <laughs> buy. I can't figure out my afternoon. <laughs> I don't know. I was. Yeah. Just, we were just talking before we started. Like, I'm going to go see Super Mario Brothers today with my kids, and I'm like, I haven't even bought tickets to that yet. <laughs> That's today. <laughs> That's, I'm in exactly the same place where they're doing this fan event where they're going to be showing off all three movies at IMAX. You get to see Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 early, and I was like, ooh, that would be fun. And then I looked at the date, and I was like, That's a month from now. I can't think that far in advance. 100%. But, you know, good for them. I think that's going to be a huge movie. They're clearly uh, pushing it a ton. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very curious to see the pre-sales for this one, particularly because we've been talking a lot about how Quantumania did not perform at the level that they needed. And then mm -hmm. we also have in the conversation Shazam 2 tanked. So, I don't know. I think we all expect Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 to be huge. I guess my question is... How huge? And talking about the Super Mario Brothers movie, that's huge this weekend as well as we're taping it. Um, and that's all due to Chris Pratt, the biggest star in the world. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you're sort of joking maybe in your tone, but he sort of is also. Yeah. And oh, they're going to, yeah, grumble, grumble. <laughs> but they're going to make a bunch more Super Marios. What I like, It's coming. Yeah. Uh, this movie, Super Mario Brothers, is like a four quadrant movie. It hits the nostalgia heads. It hits new, new kids, old kids, all kids. Well, it's also, sorry, now we're getting really far afield with talking about box office here, but it's also a 90 minute movie when there have been literally no family movies for months at this point. So there was yeah. no way it could fail this weekend. Yeah. But Genius. 
Let's turn back to Guardians. I thought this was an interesting quote where from James Gunn. He was talking about the arc of the movies to Fandango as tickets are on sale. And he mm. said, volume one is all about the mother. Volume two is about the father. And volume three is about the self. I love to hear that because I don't need another movie where it's focused on either mother or father. For mm -hmm. sure. So I'm I'm excited by the prospect of moving off that. I think it's such a a repeated thing. And this, this isn't a knock against James Gunn, but I just think so many of these movies, not even just superhero, but any hero based movie, uh, where it's just like my father, and it's like okay, we got it, <laughs> we we know what's up. So like to do it, move into this is, is exciting. Well, let me throw this out at you. He lays this out, and I think this makes a lot of sense talking about Star Lord, right? Like it's. Star-Lord's mom in the first movie, it's Star-Lord's dad in the second movie, and it's really focusing on growing up, finding yourself, and accepting yourself, not just for Star-Lord, but for the entire team. At the same time, in other places, he has talked about how Rocket is the not-so-secret protagonist of the Guardians of the Galaxy movies. We know that this movie is going to go back to Rocket's origins. Rocket has been very heavily featured in all of the posters. He was created or mangled, depending on how you want to look at it, by the high evolution evolutionary that's something that's going to play out in the movie there's a lot of rumors about maybe rocket is going to die at the end so given that he's hanging in this fandango interview the arc of the movies on star lord how does that jibe with rocket being the secret protagonist i think they do a good job in these movies of giving both star lord and rocket like a strong arc of mm -hmm. like accepting themselves and their the dealing with their family issues by accepting their the family of choice that they're in in the guardians so i think being able to sort of sew those two uh, arcs together in this movie makes a lot of sense but I, I think if you want to focus this movie on rocket you also have to focus it on star lord he is the the core of the movies he's the character we meet first he drives the whole thing like i don't think you can just do a rocket movie without being like and star lord's pretty busy too at least not now <laughs> uh do you think at any point star lord is going to say it's a me in the movie? Uh, yeah, I know. Whoops, we mixed up all the VO. <laughs> oh, no. The ultimate crossover is Super Mario and Marvel. Uh, last thing, though, that I'll ask about this, is Rocket going to die in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3? Great question. I mean, they they seem to be pretty fast and loose with letting characters die and then immediately bringing them back. So, <laughs> um, yes. Like, Gamora is died. And mm -hmm. she's a fully back in this movie, right? Yeah. So, like, what's up? <laughs> Who cares? What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Two other quick things before we wrap up here. I thought this was very funny that anybody is treating this seriously, but Frank Grillo explained why yeah. he, quote, went over to D.C. I'll very quickly read this quote from this interview he did with comicbook.com. They never told a story about Crossbones, the mythology of the MCU, and just what Marvel has in its pool of characters. It's so deep. Crossbones was there for a minute, but he was supposed to be there longer, and they went the direction they did. I think Crossbones serves a purpose, but I think the interesting thing is that if you see how many people around the world have responded to Crossbones, and again, he's on screen for a very fucking short amount of time, I think there was more there. I think there was more meat on the bone. I was disappointed, which is why I went over to DC, which the part, by the way, that I think is funny beyond just like mentioning the word crossbones a lot is the idea that like he he's an expat somehow, like he got yeah. extradited from Marvel. Or like, or like, like a headhunter. It was like, hey, crossbones, we need you over here. Like, where, where was this published? The Frank Grillo family newspaper or like <laughs> crossbonesupdates.com? Like, this is crazy. It's like being the second guard in a like a play and being like well the story really revolves around me because i hold the door for the for romeo <laughs> when he comes in <laughs> it's like the romeo verse is its own thing but see my guard universe is really moving i do think to give him some credit there is some point there in terms of frank grillo's fun in winter soldier they dispatch him very quickly at the beginning of civil war I didn't necessarily need to see more crossbones. I don't really care about that, to be perfectly frank with everybody listening. But at the same time, I don't love the idea of just killing off villains willy-nilly in case there is a story later on. Like, What, what are you talking about? You can kill <laughs> his name's Crossbones. What is his defining quality? His it's bones not... are crossed. He has a condition where his bones got crossed, and now he has to... Uh... 
you know. But like, I, I mean, I get Captain it. America. I, I don't know where, like, how this built up. If there's like, no, a bunch no, of I'm sorry. I know you're getting into it, but like, think about it. Is this classic opposites? Like, that's what heroes and villains are based on. And Crossbones' bones are crossed, and Captain America's bones are not crossed. So of course they're going to fight. Yeah. If only there was the creative juice to come up with another character that has all of the elements of Crossbones and the intense backstory that he's discussing here. I have a better question for you. And this is a serious one. Why are so many Captain America villains bone themed? I, I don't know. I feel like that's why I'm like, you think Crossbones is so special? It's like they we needed a new Red Skull and they didn't even choose different parts of the body to talk to. <laughs> Well, anyway, I'm very happy for Frank Gerlo uh, making his way over the dangerous We need a Captain for... America Joker. How about Funny Bones makes his appearance <laughs> next? <laughs> Fibula. Fibula is his new villain. Yeah. All right, last but not least, we got a rumor patrol here, and this is a big one. If it does happen, are Galactus and Silver Surfer in Fantastic Four? There are some rumors coming out about that potentially happening. It's a little unclear whether these rumors are pointing to them being like Galactus, the main villain of the Fantastic Four movie, so much as them being there as part of the cosmic fabric of the universe. Given that everybody's favorite Fantastic Movie movie is Rise of the Silver Surfer, and they just Ugh. absolutely crushed it with Galactus, the cloud in that movie. How do you think they're going to top it in this new Fantastic Four movie? Um, I guess bigger cloud, uh, less fun Silver Surfer. The mm -hmm. Silver Surfer was almost joyless in the Fantastic Four movie, <laughs> so if they could somehow make it more of a brooding mess. Oh, that would be great. That would be great. Um, I, I agree. I think this will be um, side. I think they'll introduce these characters, but I don't think it's going to be the main thrust of the movie. Like looking over when they're flying and seeing Galactus or having it be something that happens at the end of the movie, perhaps, is very exciting. Silver Surfer is one of my favorite characters. Galactus is a more of like um, a storm in the distance mm -hmm. or like a scary weather feature. So like that's like cloud made a lot of sense, I guess, to them. Like I don't need all Galactus to be hanging around and meet him. Galen, I think is the name of the comics mm -hmm. and like get his whole story. Silver Surfer, I do want that. I want to I want to meet this character and have it be find the human side. Like we've seen in so many great comic book arcs. Silver Surfer trapped on Earth has to learn what it's like to be human. Uh, but also, Silver Surfer and The Thing sort of date the same woman in some mm -hmm. comic book stories. So, so you think it's going to be a rom com? Is what you're saying? Yes, exactly. And you're going to go with The Thing over a dude who is on a surfboard all the time? Come on, <laughs> he's a surfer. <laughs> he's right? a jock. The Thing's a nerd from the Lower East Side. Come on, or Upper East Side? He has uh, all these gang ties with the Yancey Street Gang. He's bad. He's a bad boy. Oh, they're both bad boys, man. Classic Greece-style conflict there. I'll throw one thing out at you. I think if they don't go to Galactus as the villain, I would love to see Annihilus as the villain here. Mm. Take them to the negative zone. Take them off Earth. Show hopefully not the mud that we got to see in Quantumania, but show us something actually weird and cosmic and strange. Maybe Annihilus and his bug army come back to Earth. I don't know. I think there's some possibilities there in terms of some fun, wild visuals that they potentially could play with. Definitely. But how do they not do Dr. Doom? They, they've I messed up know. Doom a couple of times and we haven't enjoyed that. But don't you need a Doom in the MCU? I think Especially so. You, going into the future. Secret Wars. Yeah. 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 I think you need a Doom. It's tricky because like you're saying, they've screwed it up so many times before. So... I don't know. Just I think really all they need to give us is an actual Doctor Doom, you know, like yeah. an, an actor who has some sort of regency to him, some sort of regal behavior is just wearing the Doctor Doom costume. No fancy like his face is his mask and whatever, and blah, 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 blah. Just do yeah. it. Just do it yeah. straight forward and let it happen. He could already be the leader of Latveria. You don't need to explain his origin. His origin is he is a king with an iron mask who hates Reed Richards. Let's go. Yeah, agreed. All right, there we go. Once again, if you got any tips or suggestions for us, you can email us at comicbookclublive at gmail.com. You can support this podcast and all the podcasts we do at patreon.com slash comicbookclub. Also, we do a live show every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. to Facebook and YouTube. Come hang out. We would love to chat with you about Marvel, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice to subscribe, listen, and follow the show at Marvel Vision Pod on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, comicbookclublive.com for this podcast and many more. Until next time, stay marvelous. 
like thrilled to the confusion and mystery of cartilage, the villain that no one understands. <laughs> cartilage unleashed. <laughs>